the kick off the human portion of the evening. Um, welcome, my name is Joy Oaks, I'm a professor of English and the director of the full faculty series. I'd like to welcome community members, faculty and staff, uh, and if you're a new student, welcome to Mount Mercy, welcome everybody to Mount Mercy University. This is our sixth annual full faculty series. Uh, we always choose a topic at our, one of our spring faculty meetings, uh, something that's topical, interesting, um, and then we use an applause meter, which one is the most popular for the year. Um, after doing some fairly heavy topics, we decided to do something a little bit lighter and more fun this term. So our theme is food, setting the table, perils and pleasures of food in America. And between now and December 4th, we're going to take you on a journey from deep history, um, sort of the origins of human farming, um, and we're going to spend some time looking historically at what's been going on with food. We have a second theme that will be food that's used in shaping communities. And then finally, as we get towards Thanksgiving and harvest time, we're going to be talking about uh, sustainable food and health of our food. All right, so stay tuned. Um, you can find us at the Mount Mercy website backslash food for the rest of the series. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anna Waterman. She is an associate professor of biology and has been with the Department of Ma uh, Natural, Science, Natural and Applied Science since 2012. And she has a PhD from the University of Iowa. And as it turns out, her area of expertise is actually about skeletal biology, human health, and migration patterns of Neolithic people in Portugal. Um, so we have the expert on this particular topic with us tonight, and she's going to take us back in time and look at the earliest beginnings of what we know about humans and food. Yeah. So oh. please welcome Dr. Anna Thank you. I just lost my uh, feed for some reason. Oh. I'm not sure what happened. I moved the mouse. I did let it sit too long. One second, and then we'll get this started again. Okay. Okay, thank you for coming. I know we're really busy this week because it's the start of school. When I first learned that I was going first, I was like, I'm going first? How can I get that done with my classes? But I did. <laughs> so here it is. Um, this is a topic I'm actually, I had to, it's a large arc I'm going through, and I've had to try to pull back, and I will try not to like digress into little things because it's a topic that I know a lot about and I'm kind of passionate about. It's a really interesting thing that fundamentally changed everything for us. It is the most important change in human history, in my opinion. Um, and so the first thing I want to kind of ask you to think about is wild foods. How many of you ate something wild today? Something that was not cultivated. You picked it out in the woods, you went fishing and ate something that was not a stock pond, but an actual wild stream? Maybe, maybe. How about yesterday? Last week? During the last week, what'd you have? Um, blackberries. Okay. So blackberries. Anybody, like in the last year, would you say you eat maybe something wild? Hunted mushrooms, you, you fish, maybe hunt something occasionally, right? Um, how many of you would know what was in your backyard that you could eat? So the stores just closed down, we're all wandering around, you know, you can't, do you know, you could just kind of go outside and eat in your own backyard? Joy does. I don't know what everybody wants to eat. <laughs> right? I mean, there are, there are things, right? I, was, I put here, like, there's some basic things, like dandelions, clover, uh, this is plantain, um, hostas you can eat, right? Ferns, you can eat. It's a lot of just basic foliage you can eat in your backyard. But of course, we don't know about this. And think about that for a minute, right? Think about how disconnected we are that we don't even know what we could eat in the landscape around us. It's astonishing, actually. Now, if you go back to the human timeline, and I mean from like our genus Homo, which we put on the map about 2.5 million years ago, okay, 2.5 million years ago, all that time, until about 10, 12,000 years ago now, we were hunter-gatherers. That means that all we did was go out in the landscape and find our own food. So there was an intimate connection with the landscape. We knew 
the animals. We knew the plants. We had to. That's how we lived, right? And so <laughs> think about this. This was the majority of our evolutionary like, history. 10,000 years to us seems like a long time, but it's not in terms of evolution, animal species, deep time. It's really quick in that sense. And this is how we actually we like evolved for this way of making a living, right? This is how we kind of came on the stage as humans. And think about this, so what was life like for that long time period? Because it, obviously it's really different now. Um, people lived in really small groups. They estimate groups were not any larger than probably 50 people. So maybe 15, 20 adults and their children, as it was. When groups got too large, people had to kind of leave and go off and start their own groups. And why would that be? Not enough food in the landscape, right? There's, there is the carrying capacity of the landscape itself. It can support so many, right? Like, it's rabbits in your backyard. You have a fence in the backyard, there are some rabbits. And they can eat X amount of food. And then all of a sudden, if you get too many rabbits, there's not enough food for all the rabbits, and some rabbits die, right? So you have to kind of spread out in the landscape. So small kind of areas, and the primary institution was the family and extended family. You knew everybody who was there intimately. The groups had a high level of, they were interdependent. Everybody kind of worked together and shared, but there was this kind of like egalitarian sense. That doesn't mean that everybody was necessarily equal as they treated the same. People were treated differently according to age and like also sex, ability, Right? Those things were still kind of statuses in themselves. But there wasn't a hierarchy in terms of people who had more or less. Everybody had the same access to land and resources, and there's an obligation to share. Remember, again, these are families, right? It's kind of like you're at your family reunion. There's kind of an obligation that you're going to share those brownies and just take them all for yourself, right? You would get in trouble somehow with that. And there is, there also was that there was some like division in terms of like labor. So traditionally men would do most of the hunting and women would do most of the gathering. This doesn't mean that, that men didn't gather at all and women never hunted. It seems to be generally women might hunt fish, small game, and it generally is kind of things in which you can be like interrupted by small children, right? If you ever had small children around you, they interrupt you all the time. So if you're out hunting you know, a large game animal, that's not going to work very well. But if you're doing small stuff, it's not a big deal. They moved around a lot, right? They had to. So these are nomads. Part of being like a nomad, how many of you have like moved your house in the last five years? Was it miserable? Because you have so much stuff, you're like, why do I have all this stuff, right? Nomads don't have a lot of stuff. There's a lot of reason to gather a lot of things, right? You kind of have what you have, you move it around. You want to be able to be highly mobile. So you can break down camp, move, make a new camp somewhere else very, very quickly. And this is how they did it. And they have times, like, this is a scene which kind of showing more like ice age areas where they would like follow reindeer herds and things. People would follow large animals, follow them on their territory, right? And that would be their kind of major supply of food. So here we are now, though. This was the majority of the lifespan of humans, just like us. But we don't live this way. We live in this kind of populated urban environments, eating food that's grown. And not even, it's also now it's like manufactured, you know? It's just like industrialized food. Very different. How did this happen? Well, if we look at the kind of time period again, right? And this is what's interesting is that we had this long time period, and this is though we're all kind of hunter-gatherers and stuff, right? And imagine this era, era for 2.5 million years is stretching outside of Cedar Rapids, right? According to the timeline. It's a long ways away. And then we have this kind of magical thing that happens about 12,000 years ago, and that is people start farming in the Middle East. And then once that starts happening, we start getting this kind of rapid change in society that we think about as kind of the advent of civilization, right? People start settling down, people start uh, living in villages, we start getting hierarchies, eventually the first states are there, and it's a very kind of quick clip here. So maybe 5,000 years to establish the first states after the first farmers, and then everything kind of speeds up. 
Now, when we first think about plants and growing plants, right, it's not the idea that all of a sudden people were like, there's a light bulb in my head and we could grow our own plants, right? Of course, hunter-gatherers knew a lot more than we do about growing plants, right? They were intimately part of this kind of cycle. And so there probably was a lot of kind of tending of things, right? Like if you go out and you know where there's like a wild berry patch or something, right? You might go out and kind of tend it and kind of keep it kind of so the next year the berries are there. Or if you're a mushroom hunter, you go out and when you pick the mushrooms, you kind of let the spores kind of travel out and that way the next year there's more mushrooms for you. So people probably were tending things a little bit and caretaking for things and not just having them kind of randomly encountered. Um, and this is, you know, then we had our kind of like gardening and perhaps there was some, you know, early kind of gardening, like, you know, horticulture, things that we've been doing all summer for ourselves. And then we get to where there's the more intensive where we're actually taking the plants and domesticating them. And what that really means is we are fundamentally changing that plant in some way. And my favorite example of this is corn. So Tia Sente, which is the ancient corn plant, which is native to the New World, this is the size of it with a quarter. Now we live in corn country now, and so we know this is not the size of it any longer, right? Corn is like this now. Like how did that happen? Imagine this looks more like a wheat, a blade of grass, right? What we do is then we take that and we like select for the larger ones each time, right? And eventually over thousands of years perhaps, we have gotten this larger kind of plant which has become domesticated. And at some point too, those plants that are domesticated, they need us, right? Corn has a hard time just like reseeding like itself on its own because we've grown it to have a really tough container that we have to pull apart, right? So we've fundamentally changed things. So this domestication, there of course probably was a time period of this to this before we get to this, but this, was really a big change. Now, why? Why would after a million years, people knowing the plants, tending them, why would you start growing them? Like, what was it? And there are two major theories here, right? One is this kind of like ecological one, and that is just that the environment changed in such a way that made it possible. The other one is that we needed to because there were too many people. The populations were slowly growing in the areas, we were stretching the resources, and we had to find ways to get more food out of the same landscape. Both of these were happening in the early Holocene. Now the early Holocene is the time period where the, we are currently in the Holocene still, kind of technically, or the Anthropocene possibly. Um, but the Holocene is just a time period that kind of marks the end of the last ice age until now. And so, this is kind of looking at the temperature variation before the beginning of the Holocene. And what you should see here is that it was radically variable. We had these ice ages, we had these warming trends, right? But it was really inconsistent. Holocene starts, we get this kind of lovely, stable, warm climate that we're still in now, although perhaps it's changing now as well, right? And the idea is that this environment was suddenly you were able to control plants, to have a kind of season that you could count on, to be able to plant crops and harvest them year after year. Now, what else happened during the Holocene is that the, all the glaciers that were covering a lot of Europe, kind of Northern Europe, they receded, and we had a change in the landscape in the Mideast. And part of that change was, in this area, we had a huge amount of grasslands that kind of formed, right? So we had a bunch of wild grains that were suddenly growing everywhere in this area because of the climate change. Those plants kind of took over. It was very, it was not as dry as it is now. It was much wetter at this time period. We had these kind of lovely, long, large areas of kind of grasslands. At that same time period then, we start seeing evidence of these villages of farming implements as it is, of uh, the first bread. We find grains, the first early, like, early types of wheat we find here. And the Nufian culture, in this area right here, we find the first evidence of bread and also beer. And this is an interesting thing is that they find that beer comes on the scene 
almost at the same time as bread, right? So another way of using these wheats and stuff is brewing, and that, that maybe have been a really important thing for civilization, for kind of ceremonial use, for getting together and kind of partying, for harvest things. This thing was happening right away. And so we see then all of a sudden a kind of people settling down here and farming kind of happening. And then we see things like here, grinding stones, right? We're grinding our wheat. Um, we see evidence of kind of like round kind of houses that are probably kind of built that were semi-permanent. Um, they had an interesting burial culture where they'd have the skulls and they would put like clay on them and like shells and things. But this whole area became the early area we find that the first farmers. And you will notice too, here are the rivers. Here's be like Euphrates and the Tigris, right? So again, this is the idea we've always, the kind of cradle or the kind of Garden of Eden idea. It was here, and it was during this kind of early change in the Holocene that this stuff started to happen. Now, so we can think about, okay, so all of a sudden the climate changed, we had more people, farming kind of worked, we had all these wild grains, we could start to kind of, kind of gather them and then reseed and plant them and keep these kind of fields going. And that probably was what started to kind of happen. People had enough wild food around them to kind of settle down for a while and attend these plants. And that became kind of intimately part of their kind of lives in the landscape. Um, now, we get more food. Then, of course, you can have larger populations. Hunter-gatherers, like, they like traditionally try to keep very low population levels. And that's because you can't move around with that many children, right? You don't want more than one that you can carry. So the ideal one is that you have maybe one in arms, right? The other one's walking. And so they usually have the kind of birth spacings that are more like every four years or five years. And they have ways of doing this. They have like taboos about, about like having sex after your first child and so on. Things to kind of keep this birth spacing. It's really important um, for this. This changes in this time period, and we get this large expansion of population. Now, when you have more food, you can feed more people, but you also want to be having food for, for like storage. They start building granaries, areas to kind of store the grain, and we also get cats, right? So dogs, they were domesticated like 20,000 years ago, you know, because they were helpful like for the Ice Age hunters and so on, right? Cats. Cats came for the mice that came for the grain. And we decided, ah, let's just keep them around, right? That's useful for us. And, and cats have been part of farm life ever since, haven't they? They kind of keep the rodents down. So we start getting cats this first time, too. Now, we can think about the idea that this is a kind of circular pattern, right? Because one thing that happens is once you start moving to this, and maybe you've also settled down, more food, population growth, often there's more people, right? You're not just in a village with just your immediate family, maybe your extended family. There's a bunch of people. That means you have to have some kind of more like socially co like complicated way of dealing with them, of interacting with them, with your new neighbors, right? Um, you also start doing things like new technology and different types of crafts. You need the ceramics. Ceramics come in about this time period. People are building a lot, making pots and things, um, making new things to process grains, right? It's all about the idea that we are living in a different way now. We need different stuff. We gotta build our houses. All of a sudden, if you're settled down, you can start to accumulate stuff, right? You have to move it. So let's make stuff and keep it in our houses for ourselves. Um, but also, one thing you're gonna need is you're gonna need land. And so this is a cycle that starts. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that there is a biological feedback system as well as a cultural one about children and agriculture as opposed to hunter-gatherers, right? Hunter-gatherers, they tend to usually wean later. They usually breastfeed their kids for three to four years, you know, and that's what they did forever. And that kept fertility low because it does impede ovulation. Um, with the advent of having agriculture, you also had these kind of wheat, and you could make these kind of like rules, and they usually wean children earlier. Weaning children earlier made people were they would ovulate sooner after childbirth, and they could have more children. So all of a sudden, spacing became more like every two years you have a child instead of every three, or three like or four. Now, that may not be a lot in someone's lifetime, but over a thousand years. This means a really major increase in populations that are happening. Also, 
If anybody grew up on like a farm, you probably know this, right? Children are really important in farm life, right? For the reason as they are cheap labor. Like, I don't know any farm kid who's not really hardworking because they were out there all the time, tending the animals and doing things. It's an expectation, right? And you want to have a lot of kids, a lot of hands, to do a lot of farm work for you. Now, of course, the problem with increasing populations, right, is that all of a sudden, we need more resources. We need more land. We have to grow more food. That means all of a sudden people are going to have some conflicts over land systems. Who owns the land? Who gets to farm on that land? Who gets to take over that new piece of land and farm on that, right? We have to have some kind of system for assigning who gets what land, how it's farmed, right? But also, there's conflicts too in terms of um, the actual storage of the grain. If you have stored grain and that's like money, that's valuable, you're going to need to figure out some way to keep it safe as well, right? So it becomes this kind of different kind of system. Hunter-gatherers, they're not worried about anybody coming and stealing anything. There's nothing to steal. They're just going to pack up and move on anyway, right? Take anything you want. They can make anything they need in a day, basically. So now we see this, these small areas start to spread out. And we can think about these as being a combination of maybe cultural, maybe other hunter-gatherers adopt farming, but probably also farmers are moving into new land. And we can look at the spread of farming into Europe. So we're starting here, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, we start to see this kind of spread of the grains and farmers up into Europe, up in here about 7,000 years ago. And I should mention that the animals came with this. So domesticated animals started pretty quickly after we started growing food, basically. Um, and those would be you know, sheep, goats, those are really kind of early ones. Later kind of cows, pigs, um, pigs in Asia, very kind of early on. But then we see this kind of change here, right? Now, this land's not empty. This land, I mean, it's not densely populated, but it's still filled with these, these like, like you know, hunter-gatherers who lived in Europe. So slowly, people are pushing out populations. Probably some adopt the culture or they marry into it, but a lot of it's changed over. In fact, when we look at the genome of modern Europeans, it's almost the majority is all from like the Mideast and then part of it from the steppes, this giant like wave that moved in in the Bronze Age. But it's not the old hunter-gatherers. They were mostly just kind of taken over by these farmers who moved in to have the better land. Now, when we look at domestication, I want to point out that it didn't just happen in one place. It happened in multiple places at different times independently. Um, and so we should keep that in mind, that we have other centers. So this is the earliest, this is kind of like Fertile Crescent, but people started, uh, rice and millet in Asia um, started about 6,000 BC. Um, we get uh, corn, of course, in Mesoamerica, um, uh, squash, manioc, those kind of things, and uh, uh, throughout here, millet and, and sorghum in Africa. So, People were figuring out farming in a lot of places, and again, this may be due to this kind of you know, climate that we're in, still in today, is the Holocene, as it was. But also, there are people who did not take up farming as well. So just because you are around farmers, I mean, you want to be a farmer as well. Um, now, specialization became a thing which was attached to this for a particular reason, and the idea is that, like, we are now specialists, right? I'm assuming that most of you guys don't grow your own food for a living, then be like a farmer. So if you're not, then you're like a specialist in some other kind of way. What happens when you have food supplies, right? You can spend your time doing other things, other tasks, and you become a specialist in making something else. Making ceramics, making stone tools, making blades. Um, Pottery, woodworking, leather, all these things. People try to spend their time doing other things than gathering their own food because the food supply w was there. This also creates a kind of market place for things as well. Then we start getting like cities and hierarchy. When you're, um, and this becomes a very interesting question for me always is how did this happen? Hunter gatherers, if they're unhappy with what's going on in their group, right, 
they can always walk with their feet. The idea is like, you don't like this, you can just take off and go start your own group. Happens a lot. There's a lot of evidence of people being like, I'm taking my friends and we're gonna go start our own camp over here because we don't like what you're doing. And you can do that because you don't need those people. You already know how to do everything on your own, right? But at some point, we started living in these hierarchies where we had people who were in charge of us. And at some point, that happened and we allowed it to happen. And the reason why I'm not gonna go into a lot today because it's a whole other talk, um, but one idea is just like this like you know, theory that it's like Monopoly. When you play Monopoly, right, you all start out with the same amount of money, but do you end with the same amount of money? No, you don't. Why not? Just because you're a terrible player, right? Yes. Some, sometimes, right? But normally it just is, you're just rolling the dice and you're just landing on properties and you're just buying them if you had the money, right? And then somebody gets a lucky dice roll and somebody gets the free parking spot and gets the money in the middle if you played that way, which we did, right? Or people land on the jail thing, like go to jail, right? It's just kind of the luck of the draw. One idea was that certain families perhaps had better land, more resources, uh, better political like alliances, and they were able to use this, these like, connections and like leverage them to kind of start being kind of more in power in their local towns and, and the communities. You start getting, at this time period, chiefdoms and eventually early states. Now, chiefdoms aren't quite like states today, like we live in a state here today, because they're, in prehistory, they're oftentimes a little bit loose, right? Chiefs kind of come to power and fall from power pretty quickly because people are like, ah, we're not following him anymore. They don't have a lot of real strong manpower to coerce people. They're just more like natural leaders and people kind of follow them and stuff. Later on, you get systems in which there is coercion. There are rules of law. There are enforcement of these laws. There are people who specialize in enforcing these laws and so on, and those are the states. Now, this is important, right? The pristine states. State States started in different parts of the world at different, par at different times independently. Okay, so these are the ones that are not connected, as we know of, from any other state. And again, I want you to look at where these are. So Mesopotamia here, Nile Valley, Indus Valley, here in China, Mesoamerica, and then look at the origins of, of domestication. There's an overlap here. You can't have a state without intensive farming. You can't have a state without enough food to feed the people of the state. So states rose up, not everywhere you had farming, but in a lot of places they did. So we have our new kind of states here. And then most of the other states, right, they get, they become states because they are connected and contacted by the like pristine state and it kind of takes over and kind of uh, all the other unconnected areas. So trades of early states. Intensive agriculture is number one in terms of you have to have this necessarily. Writing. This is where we start getting writing. And I love to ask my students this question. What do you think the first, the first writing was about? The first written documents, the like cuneiform that they had, the little like impressions and things. What were they talking about? Yeah. Accounting is correct, right? At some point, you're trading grain, you're trading things, you need to have a way, a system of keeping track of who owes who what. And a lot of the early kind of tiles were actually saying, okay, you're gonna give me X amount of grain at the harvest. And I have the tile, we have an agreement, and so on. So it was an accounting system for stuff. So writing came in, and all the states, all of these states have writing in one form or another. It's an important part because the state really can't control everything without keeping records about everything. They need the records for the taxes, right? Okay, so we get that centralized government of some kind, right? Some kind of seated power of people who are in charge. Um, you get craft specialists and also government specialists, right? If you have writing, you need scribes and like bureaucrats and all that, all that kind of comes in as well. Um, you start getting like monumental architecture of this time period. That does not mean that um, you only have this with states. We have this other early prehistoric 
things that were kind of built and stuff. But it's a very common thing. You start getting like large temples and those kind of things, these kind of trappings of kind of states that it is. And religion, you get organized religion that the state is somehow in control of, right? That they are, they are organized with the state is an intimate part of that. Hunter-gatherers generally, they don't have a really kind of like, their system is much more like animism usually, or kind of spirits and ancestors, and not organized in the same kind of way. This is a very organized system. So basically what you get is, you get the, the origins of class society. And this is what happens when you have states that's based upon having farming, and we couldn't have that be before that. So we have our different kind of classes, and eventually we're gonna have people who are disconnected, who are now unlanded, right, who don't own their land anymore, or can't own land, and they're just trading their like, labor for wages, right? Because uh, like, if you're a hunter-gatherer, all you gotta do to feed yourself is go out on a landscape, hunt the animals, you know, gather your kind of plants, but if you don't have those skills, and in fact, there's no land that you can actually go out and like forage on because it's all kind of owned. The only thing left for you to do is to trade your labor for wages, for food. I can work for food, right? That's the new system for a lot of people. This allows for, for things like the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire spent a huge amount of time trekking grain around. They had a supply chain. A lot of that supply chain was all about feeding the armies moving it around. They had grain they would take from like North Africa and they would move it to Rome and they would move it out as they're moving into new territories throughout Europe, right? They had to have that. They had to feed the empire and they had to do this by intensive agriculture and transporting grains around. Now, today, right? This is how far we've actually come. Here's a map of kind of generally used areas that are used for like farming today. Um, and what do you note about it? What areas are not being used for farming? Deserts, tundra, right? Places where you cannot grow stuff is not being used for farming. Any place that you can grow stuff is being used for farming. Because we have a lot of people that we have to feed now and we need to have intensive, intensive farming all over to do this. And look at the like, political world today. Is there any place, any piece of land now that's not a state, a nation state of some kind, run by some kind of government, this kind of system? There's not, right? Within a very short period of time, we've taken over the entire planet in terms of these like, nation states, but also in terms of agriculture and being people who our lives are based upon the growing of food for us in general. Look at hunter-gatherers today. There are still some. There are still people. And they're usually in marginalized land that's not good for farming. And that's why we've kind of had them stay there, right? It's kind of like, oh, you guys can stay here because we don't really care about this piece of land. Um, but look at this. So 1500 BC, everywhere, right? Um, Sorry, 15,000 BC. 1500 BC, we see a mixture here, right? There's still some hunter, get a lot of North America, but still some South America and Africa. And then look at today, like in the year 2000. There's, you know, there's just little tiny patches of people who still live this way in the Amazon or oftentimes in areas in which we're just not, people don't care enough about them to move them off that land anymore. So that's a huge, tremendous change in a very short period of time. Now, what are the consequences, right? What does this kind of mean about this, about us now living in these dense urban environments? Well, there's kind of a paradox here. And so when I oftentimes talk to my students about these same kind of questions, you know, they're kind of like, there's a view where, of course, like, this led to civilization. And civilization is good because here we are, right? We've been up sitting here with a computer, and like the light, this building, you know, in a university, this would not be here if we were all still hunter-gatherers, this wouldn't happen. But then there's also the kind of detrimental part of it, right? The things that we have, we've, we've lost as part of this change. And so here's the things that kind of happen. And interestingly enough, this has really affected health in an adverse way, okay? When people start like settling down and living in dense groups, oftentimes with animals, 
right? And accumulating like a lot of like waste, the rate of disease go up because there's a lot more people that pass on a lot more viruses and parasites. The bacteria have a place to kind of grow because you're kind of living with your animals, there's kind of waste. There's the viruses that are like jumping from the animals to the humans. That's all happening too, right? So we have a higher instances of like disease. Mortality for children goes up. Now, of course, we're having more children, so we can kind of lose a couple, right? But again, because you're weaning children earlier, that means that their they're, they're like immune system don't have as long to kind of grow and develop, right? And they're living in an area that has a higher load in terms of like parasites, bacteria, and so on. So more children get sick. I have uh, excavated like a couple like burials um, in Portugal that are like 5,000 years old or so, and they are half children. And that's normal, right? You would expect to lose half your kids by the age of five. Um, you get injuries, so like repetitive stress injuries from like labor, right? Arthritis, those kind of things kind of go up increase. Dental caries, people have, people's teeth get a lot worse because they're eating a lot of like grain and like carbohydrates, right? And kind of sugary things for your teeth. So those kind of go up. Uh, people are, eating a lot more grain and eating a lot less wild resources so that dietary that, that dietary breath goes down and so there's like anemia and things people actually have um, more commonly in this time period um, and we have done studies which show that farmers actually work more hours every day than people who are foraging right now farmers have a you work more hours, of course, there is a guarantee, right? You're trying to work toward the guarantee that there will be food for you, so perhaps the investment's worth it. But you're still working a lot more hours than you were if you were just going outside, killing a deer, picking some apples. Okay. So we have this kind of chain of events that happens, right? We have this kind of good things. We get a dependable food supply, more people, surplus, efficient labor, trade, goods and values, then feuds and wars over the stuff we now have. Slavery, increase in equality, you know. Wealth becomes hereditary. And that's an interesting thing, right? At a certain point, families are able to accumulate wealth and hang on to it and pass it on to the next generation and so on. So we have this accumulation of wealth throughout families as well. And power becomes more concentrated in areas. So we do have an effect of this in the end that it has led to the kind of elite uh, classes that we kind of see now today. This would not be possible without agriculture leading the states and so on. So we do have, this is one direct kind of consequence that we can say uh, make press is negative. Um, but one thing to really think about now is the environment, right? We're at a point right now with the earth where we're kind of worried about the environment and um, the Amazon's burning apparently right now as we're sitting here. Um, farming requires deforestation. It just does, right? I mean, most of the time you're gonna be cutting down land that something else is growing on, even if it's not in like a forest, but you are changing the landscape itself. Um, and the more, far, the more land you're farming, the more trees and other environments that are gone. And of course, the animals with this, right? So in some ways, farming may have been the worst thing that ever happened to the environment. Now, if you think about that too, right? Think about the, the land use, right? And the destruction that has caused the like, natural world due to this. We have transformed the majority of the land on earth that we could farm into farmland, which means we displaced whatever those like natural landscapes were and the animals and the ecosystems that lived there before. So this is kind of like, are you for the people or are you for the animals, right? We're kind of making choices here about who is more valuable in how we kind of use the kind of land. So that's my getting us up to kind of now. And then I have a couple of like illustrations about interesting things since then with kind of food and the, move, the movement of food, and then I will take questions. So just bear with me for a couple more slides. Okay, so another interesting thing to think about is 
how is this interplayed with how we live today? Our kind of global systems, the like a political systems, the transport of food, food economy now. And there's some interesting things that happen because of the movement of food around the world. So we started growing food, but in different places, we have different crops. So one thing to keep in mind is that for a long time, we weren't really transporting things back and forth between the new and old world. And so in prehistory, we kind of find the old world as being you know, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the new world is the, you know, North and South America. And of course, we can say, well, the Vikings, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But in general, right, there was not large amounts of things being moved back and forth across these kind of areas. And we had a very different sets of foods, of animals, of plants, right, of like, you know, cultures, that were on these two areas of the world. Now, I want you to look at this list of new world plants and old world plants, because I always find this really fascinating, right? These are the plants that were all like indigenous to the new world, not found on the old world. Old world, not in the new world. And what you will notice right away is you'll see in this list things that you don't associate in that way, right? So tomatoes, wait, wait, you mean the Italians didn't have tomatoes before the 1500s? Yes, I do mean that, exactly. There was no tomato sauce in Italian food before that. Also peppers, no peppers either. Peppers are a new world thing. Potatoes, how much of Europe lives on the potato, right? New world crop, not old world crop. We associate things like sugar oftentimes with the new world, right? Plantations and stuff, old world, brought over to the new world to plant here. Um, also, things like uh, all of these uh, various animals did not exist in the new world. They all came over um, with the old world change. So there's this uh, kind of time period that we talk about being the Columbian exchange. And it basically is this, you know, early colonialism after Columbus sailed across the ocean and so on. And we started to massively move crops around and animals around. And we kind of reconfigured. So once again, we're not just farming everywhere and changing those environments where they were naturally. We are moving food around and planting things in areas where they had not been before and reconfiguring these systems in a new way as well by putting these things places. So we moved all these things from the, from the old world to the Americas and then things back through here and did this exchange. Now I want you to take note here, one of the major things that we exchanged from the old world to the new world is disease. Smallpox, measles, Malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough, flu, even, right? And in this exchange, and anybody know what? And what we don't see is actually a lot of diseases going back the other way. Maybe I think like syphilis, we know now, was in a new world originally, but there's not as many. Any ideas why that is? Why do we have all these diseases in the old world and not in the new world? Not as much movement. Well, there was, there were fewer people for sure, and there definitely that kind of plays into a component of this. The main reason is because in the old world we had a lot of livestock, and a lot of those diseases actually came from animals, right? And then the people in the old world had been living with these animals for thousands of years, so they had gotten like used to this. They had some natural immunity to this. When we get to the new world and bring this in because the New World, first of all, the population is a, a segment that came over from Asia mostly. So there's kind of a narrow genetic um, kind of like a window there. Um, and they were not adapted for these diseases. They estimate that between 50 and 90% of populations got wiped out in the New World. This is a startling figure, okay? Even if we say not 90, and I think 90 is probably pretty high. Let's say 50. Let's say 50% of people who lived in the New World, in the Americas, died after 1500 because they had no immunity to, to these new diseases that were coming over. 
like, and this is one thing that happened like, uh, to like the Aztecs, right? Like how are the Aztecs, how are they defeated by a couple of kind of European boats with some horses and people, right? There was like thousands and thousands of warriors and they were fierce, right? They were kind of hard to have their enemies. Smallpox, flu. There are stories about when just they went like wildfire through these civilizations and it, just people are just dying in the streets everywhere from it, right? That was part of the kind of conquering of the new world. Part of it was through diseases to be wrought with this. So again, this is a direct line to the domestication of animals, the movement of kind of people and crops fundamentally changed this, right? And you think about this, this actually happened where it came up. Let's say you started here. These things moved up into North America. So populations that we did not like, like that the Europeans did not find when they were moving over in the 1700s. Like, oh, it's all just empty land. Part of it was partially because people had died 200 years ago. The populations were much lower than they kind of used to be. So again, a very interesting thing that happened because of these kind of like exchanges that are part of. I'm sad. Now, my, my last one is a kind of back to Europe one. So I'm doing one over and then one kind of back. And that is the potato, right? The potato is so popular in Northern Europe climates because it was magical there, right? The potato was first, you know, grown like in the Andes and stuff, and they were pretty small and there was different types. And they were not, it was not like the staple, staple crop. When they brought it over to Europe, it just did so well that they started growing tons of it. And it became really the cheap source of calories for the poor of Northern Europe, right? This was peasant food, and that you were able to get three times as much food out of it than just growing wheat. And we still know this now today, right? We still use potatoes as this cheap kind of like, you know, food. It's the filler food. You get a hamburger, you get fries. You get this, you get mashed potatoes, right? We all still use it in this kind of way. So it became the kind of cheap food for the workers as it was. Now, in Ireland, partially because of the advent of a new kind of supply of kind of cheap food, the population, you know, like doubled from four to eight, eight million in a certain time period, right? So in less than a hundred years, we had this huge increase in population, probably partially because it's kind of cheap food, the potato, and half the population at some point depended on the potato to stay alive. Then comes, the great potato famine, right? Now, because of course we're farming now and we're bringing this one type of potato and we're planting just one type everywhere, if there's like a blight, there was a blight. And all of a sudden this blight wiped out this crop, right? For years, it could not get reestablished. And it devastated the potato farmers in the area, you know, for like four years or so. Over a million people died of mass starvation because the potato crop failed. And then people also died because they were sick for disease and various things too. And also, this also meant another two million left. And they immigrated to the US here, to the mainland, right, and over in Britain. Some of my ancestors left during the Irish, the, this, this famine and came here. So I am partially here because of this whole thing with the potato and the Columbian exchange and then the potato famine, right? It, it, for all of us. And so that's my kind of last kind of, up, kind of update for the modern kind of world. Um, but again, my general kind of talk and conclusions here, I'm trying to kind of, kind of actually get across, is that the dawn of agriculture set the stage for the most radical transformation that humankind ever knew. It fundamentally transformed our entire society into what we're kind of living in today. And like, for better or worse, that is our foundation. Right, and so we should kind of consider it living in a state like this, how important that is um, to the way we actually live, live today. So thank you for listening. That's my talk. I'm happy to take questions. I want to thank, you have questions? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and I want to thank um, Joy and everybody who helped to organize the fall faculty series. This is my first time doing a talk for, for it. My, I'm happy I did. Yes? So you made note of the uh, death rate of the children. Mm -hmm. um, it said that the farm families would typically have X number of children, seven of them would die. 
I wondered if your research covered any of the maternal mortality rates because, you know, pregnancy after pregnancy after pregnancy without spacing right. children definitely has an effect on maternal mortality. I would say for sure that went up. That's a little harder to see in the skeletal record because it can be hard to actually be able to like diagnose that. As being. Occasionally you actually do find skeletons where there is like a fetus, there's like fetal bones inside and you can possibly, you know, think that maybe she died in childbirth, was it was. Um, but otherwise it's hard to necessarily say that that was the cause of death. I would assume though that that would have been a cause of death that happened quite regularly. Oh, so glad you asked. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> so our current understanding, if we get back to our my timeline, okay. So Neanderthals came on the scene in Europe, um, and they were probably living around 400,000 years ago, up to about 35. Um, thousand years ago and they were hunter-gatherers right so they were just like the kind of early humans they were hunter-gatherers in the same kind of way and they were mostly uh, more cold adapted and they mostly did a lot of like you know like hunting ice age animals in Europe though we do find they did do some like fishing and probably if there were plants available they would eat those as well um, and we do find that they were probably now there may have been some looking for a picture of Europe there we go. So we do find some of the latest kind of holdouts for like Neanderthals are actually way over in Western Europe, like in Portugal and places. And so we do think that they, there probably were some, still some like holdout populations um, that perhaps uh, got pushed around by the human hunter-gatherers kind of coming up into the area as, as well. They were probably all gone by the time that the farmers really kind of got there, but we find evidence more and more every day about these kind of holdout groups that were, that were there for much kind of longer. It's like the little, like, uh, the hobbit on the island of Flores. That dates to like 10,000 years ago, right? That means there was like a little hobbit hominid running around the same time as this. So it's very possible that you can still find these holdouts. Did they farm at all? No, no. Farming is completely, um, it's just like, it's a trait of like modern humans. So at this point, by about 10,000 years ago, we usually think that all the other hominids are mostly gone. We find occasional evidence that perhaps there was these kind of holdouts, little islands in Asia and those kind of things, but they were just hunter-gatherers for sure. I mean, who knows, maybe there could be evidence someday, but none right now. Yeah? Talk about cooking. Like, like when cooking started, the effect it had or, or okay. the effect it so cooking, as far as we know, we think the earliest fire in kind of cooking probably started about a couple million years ago. Um, and that would be like erectus. So we think of like uh, early, early humans before we were like the homo sapiens today, which is about 300,000 years ago, there was fire prior to that. And that cooking probably started with the fire at the same kind of time period. We were like butchering large animals. And then actually cooking probably had to do with our evolution um, in terms of our like guts and things. So one thing about like modern humans is we have a smaller gut and that probably is due to cooking food, especially meat. And it's easier than to actually process cooked food. You can also get more like calories out of it because you're not spending all the calories processing it in your gut too. So cooking food actually was a real benefit in terms of not starving to death. Um, I used to argue too that it's like the, the fire. Like, okay, so you know how like we love the fire, right? I mean, we can sit and look at a fire forever and we're mesmerized by it. That's like so deep in our, in our history. Think about people, fire, cooking food, sitting around the fire, keeping away the dangerous animals and talking to each other. This has been going on for millions of years. And the reason why I think still today we have such a love of it, where other animals don't like fire, right? Is because it was our first TV, right? This was our original thing. Like we still today love sitting around a campfire and telling stories. We were doing that a million years ago. I think it still is probably actually a deep kind of part of what kind of made community in some ways too, so. 
my pipe back. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about the potato famine. Mm -hmm. What is what is in place for something like that uh, to happen with corn? Uh, you know, if I, we I had know it's bread to try to resist all this. Right. Is it possible? It's possible. I mean, if there was some kind of like the development of some kind of new, uh, new like like you know corn disease, and like Monsanto couldn't figure out how to how to combat it, sure, you know, it could blight. But it's also the corn too. Is the same thing when you're like monocropping and you're putting in the same the same type of plant over and over again. There's not like a variation of it too, right? So if you find the proper like like a pest that will decimate it it can decimate all of it. So a blight like that everywhere. I think that we're so controlling right now of the farm field and the stuff that goes on there to keep the pests away and the herbicide. I think it'd be hard to do, but it certainly could happen. There is some mutation, you know, some new kind of plant bug. Yeah. Yeah, some fascinating aspects about the development of agriculture is that Rise of banking and finance yep. and trade. Yep. Uh, finance in order to facilitate trade. And then the requirement for uh, an immense surplus in order to support an urban population and the military. Yes. Uh, so I wonder if you could comment uh, on the rise of the, of, the, uh, of the military and the leisure classes under uh, conditions of uh, uh, domestication of agriculture? So I mean, that's definitely kind of the question about like how did this lead to the state? Um, and some of the theories about like how the kind of states formed, uh, one of them is this idea that it was kind of like, it was about the like protection racket, right? So all of a sudden you have a lot of grain and you have to store it someplace. Often you need people who are going to kind of keep your grain safe for you. And then people were able to kind of use that, that kind of power in terms of we're going to build the infrastructure and keep the grain safe. And that's going to lead to a, a power system, people who are kind of like in charge and maybe have the power. So the idea is that maybe like that you have this kind of early chiefs that kind of came to power and they're probably kind of like uh, still kind of part of family systems and stuff. And that they were there to kind of store the grain and keep the grain and then uh, that some of these were able then to kind of cement power in a way to kind of keep people around. I think part of it was as all the land filled in, right, you couldn't go anywhere to get new land to kind of grow on your own. People got more and more where they would just tend other people's land and then they have kind of less power over it. So I'm sure there was a, a kind of sharecropping that kind of on time periods. Eventually, right, somebody formed it where they had you know, militaries and soldiers and people kind of stopped working. And that probably was a ways out from the really kind of early changes that happened. But I think it's probably a slow cementing of power. People also used the like, religion as well, right? So if you have an organized religion, if you're a king, one of the best ways of maintaining being king is to be that you're king because God said you're king, right? This makes a really an easy way to kind of maintain this kind of idea that there's a reason why there's a royalty is because you're supposed to be, and then people are supposed to follow the rules. And then if you don't follow the rules, bad things are going to happen to you, right? And they do find that with these early states, we find the early kind of part of moralizing religion, right? They did kind of like, you need to do these things. Otherwise, it's bad. And if it's bad, then you're going to be punished somehow by the gods or, you know, by the king and, and so on. So there must have been some kind of control there because at some point people just kind of worked and you paid your money. I mean, it could be kind of like a peasant society, like in you know, feudalism, where there is a kind of lord who kind of has the kind of manor and the house and the castle. And you have the kind of lands. And part of that trade is you're going to be given the Lord part of your crop every year, that kind of tax, and then in return, he's going to take care of you against any enemies, right? So there's enemies coming in. Well, bring everything up to the castle, and you guys can all come inside and wait, and we can kind of keep the grain. But either way, things happen. People are able to like, like leverage power in such a way to negotiate these kind of systems. 
and then it did obviously you had to have these things to kind of fund them eventually you get you get like gold and money and stuff and then also eventually right you get the rise and fall of these things so occasionally people rise up and say we're not doing this anymore and they kind of flood the castle and take over and stuff today you know you think about it in the past when like money was like a real thing like gold or valuables or grain like peasants could take their pitchforks and go to the castle and like you know we're taking all the all the gold right we're deposing the king we're putting in a new king and so on um now it's just an idea it's just an electronic number in a bank someplace right i mean you can barely like overthrow like a country and then take any of the assets, right? Syria, what they do? They transfer all their money into like Russian banks, right? It's just a number disappearing that used to be part of the Syrian economy and now it's like someplace else. So it's different now, but that may or may not have answered your question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's hard to kind of see those exact kind of connections, but eventually people gained power and they were able to kind of like use that to control the rest. A fascinating book uh, that takes into account uh, the development of agriculture and the rise of centralized authority is a book entitled Forgive Us Our Debts uh, by a guy named Michael Hudson. Mm -hmm. And he observes that uh, uh, when a new king would take over, one of the first things that person did was to forgive the debts mm -hmm. of uh, people in the land so that uh, they were free to not only to farm, but also to serve the king as, uh, uh, as laborers or in the military. Yeah, I think so, even, yeah. Did they do that like, like in England for a while, like with the Jubilee? The Jubilee, yeah, part of the, the Jubilee, Jubilee was, was, the, what was the debt right. forgiveness? Every seven years, you know, in uh, I think biblical literature talked about every seven years, you kind of reset the clock. And right. Every 50, you're supposed to have a major thing. And so the biblical writers kind of adapted that from, uh, from uh, Babylonian culture. So. Right. I mean, it does make sense that at some point to kind of maintain power or something, there has to be some kind of like leveling of the system and that it may level on its own if you don't choose to take the steps to level it yourself, right? That's how you kind of get large, you know, big rebellions and things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, technically in the, in the U.S., we're not supposed to have any debts that's beyond 30 years. That's why the longest mortgage you can get is like 30 years. That's legally the longest you can have a debt held against you before it has to be legally forgiven. But that's a long time <laughs> if you own houses or student loans. The other thing that fascinates me about biblical literature is that there was a period in the seventh century when a king named Josiah uh, uh, centralized the cult in Jerusalem uh, because the temple was essentially a financial institution, religious and financial. It's a, uh, it was kind of a bank. Right. And uh, people were populating the countryside with these little uh, alternate sites or cults and setting up their own operations. And so the extent to which the temple served as a banking facility, uh, uh, when, uh, when the prophets would, or priests would decry people not participating in the cult, it was a thing for thriving economically. Right. And that's why you would predict these. Uh, these disasters and so on. So it's, a, it's, it's really, really an interesting area to get yeah. into. Yeah. So on, on that note, I just want to plug our talk of the first Tuesday in November. Our chaplain, Dr. Tony Ando, Father Tony, will be talking about food from a biblical perspective. So we'll have a, a whole session to talk about that. Um, it happens to be on election day, so go vote and then <coughs> Anybody else? Call it a night. Okay. Well, thank you very much. For it was a little heavy at times. Just a little heavy.